Mr. McCoy here with part five of the ear, the eye, and the arm. Stuff it, night, said the person who was carrying Tendai. We'd have cops on us like flies on your granny. Don't you insult my granny, shouted Knight. She's the best woman in the world. How come she's trying to turn us in? That proves how good she is, Fist. She doesn't like low-down crooks. I'll never understand you, said Fist. Tendai went over the last moments at Mabar Musaka. These must be the men who threw peanuts at the blue monkey. That rotten monkey... Tendai understood how betrayed Rita felt when the rat attacked her. Rita, he thought. Where is she? And Kuda. What do you think? Where is Rita and Kuda? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. He felt gently around the bag and found a Rita-sized lump pressing against the cloth. Tendai still had his scout knife, so he carefully cut a small opening and looked out. To the right, also bouncing along on Fist's back, was a second bag. Farther away, Knife carried a third one. So, they were all together. Tendai could rip through the cloth and yell for help, except that he didn't see people or buildings through the hole. They were being carried through a vast wasteland. Greasy gray hills rose on either side. The ground squelched under Fist's heavy feet and his footprints filled like sludge. Everything looked impossibly used and discouraged. This must be Dead Man's Flay, thought Tendai. He didn't know anything about it except that the bus driver refused to land there. What do I do now? He thought. I can't abandon Rita and Kuda. It struck Tendai the father had been right all along. The minute they got outside, they had been kidnapped. Father will be furious when he finds out, thought Tendai with a lump in his throat. He'll blame me. I wonder why Fist and Knife want to carry us off. So far, neither man had mentioned where they were going. Will they hold us for ransom, wondered Tendai. Maybe we're going to be slaves, Lamellower had told them about such things in bedtime stores. The slave trade once flourished in Africa, the praise singer said. It still existed in Gondwana. Children sent out to herd goats were snapped up by evil traders, loaded onto camels, and taken to far cities where they suffered horribly. In the Mellower stories, these children always escaped and wound up rich and happy. It sounded exciting, but right now, in the first part of the story, the suffering part, Tendai thought he would rather be home and bored. Still, the idea of a real adventure lifted his spirits. He made another opening in the bag next to Fist's belt. The belt was a crude twist of sisal. Tendai cut through it, except for a few strands. I don't see the she-elephant, said Knife, startling Tendai so much he almost severed the belt completely. She's in the shibin. Smell the pineapples, Fist said. Even through the bag, Tendai picked up the reek of overripe fruit. Come forth, my beauty, shouted Fist. Your glances stick to my heart like peanut butter to the gums. Knife cried. See what gifts we bring? Oh, generously shaped one, whose neck a louse may not climb without a rest? Hold your noise, said a cross voice that seemed to come out of the earth. Nag, nag, nag. The minute I sit down, never a moment's peace. Wait up, you satsas. Knife and Fist laughed and shook out their bags. Tendai, Rita, and Kuda fell onto the ground. Tendai pretended to be unconscious, but Rita scrambled to her feet and shrieked. You boo-boo heads! Wait till my father gets his hands on you! You'll need a rocket ship to stay ahead of him! Squeaks loudly, doesn't she? remarked Fist. If I'm a mouse, you're a dirty old rat in a pile of rotten meat bones. Take us home at once, shouted Rita. Tendai saw, through half-closed eyes, that Kuda was sitting up and holding his head. The little boy seemed too dazed to speak. Look what you did to him, Rita yelled, hauling Kuda to his feet. You're going to prison forever. Sounds like Granny, said Fist. Yes, she does, replied Knight with grudging admiration. Tendai flopped over to bring himself near Rita and Kuda, but he pretended to be too weak to stand. What did you do to him? demanded Rita. He'd better be okay. If you so much as chipped a toenail, father will chew you up like a lion's dinner. 
Who is this father you keep squeaking about? said Knife in a bored voice. No, don't tell him, whispered Tendai, grasping Rita by the ankle. But she stamped her foot angrily. General Matsika, that's who. You don't think you're so clever now. The two men did seem stunned by this news. Oh, mother, said Fist. Oh, granny, murmured Knife. Tendai lunged at Fist and yanked his pant leg. The belt parted, the pants fell down. Fist struggled to grab them, and Tendai pulled his leg out from under him. When Rita reacted at once, she bounded over the vlay with a speed surprising for her plumpness. Knife started after her. Kuda tried to run, but he couldn't keep up with his short legs. As Tendai went by, he scooped the little boy into his arms. The added weight slowed him terribly. Fist tripped over his pants again and fell with a splat on the ground. He hit his head on a rock and lay still. Knife, a much smaller and more fit man, zigzagged after Rita as she darted around hillocks and bushes. He roared at her to stop and she yelled insults back. Tendai thought as he struggled with Kuda that Rita never knew when to leave well enough alone. Every time she turned to scream, she lost some of the distance between herself and Knife. Then Tendai lost sight of them behind a hill. He swung down a valley and up again, his side stabbed with pain. His lungs couldn't get enough air. His legs threatened to collapse. He rounded another hill and threw himself into a hollow in the ground. Kuda, bug-eyed with terror, seemed about to scream. Don't! gasped Tendai, covering his brother's mouth with his hand. Hide! Kuda seemed to understand. He clamped his mouth shut and stared solemnly at Tendai. They listened to the wind rustling the heaps of trash because now that Tendai had time to rest, he saw that the hills, the ground, and everything was a mass of packed garbage. The springiness of the earth was caused by thousands and thousands of plastic bags. Tendai was awed. Plastic hadn't been used for hundreds of years, not since the energy famine of the 21st century. He had seen plastic bowls and cups in museums, but the raw material lay all around them here. It was torn and greasy and caked with mud, but it was still plastic. After he had caught his breath, Tendai stood up and pulled Kuda to his feet. Let's go, he whispered, but froze at once. Up from the lonely hills, drifting on the wind, came a woman's voice. Catch children! Bring them to me! The wind blew it away. Tendai hoisted Kuda to his back and the little boy clasped his arms around his big brother's neck. Bring them to me! called the far deep voice. Tendai stumbled on, trying to ignore the ache in his legs. Kuda screamed, The ground is moving! Tendai saw and almost fell to the ground so great was his terror that chunks of the ground that he took for trash stood up. They moved toward him from all sides. Even down in the hollow where they had just hidden, a lump detached itself and crept up the side. Mama! Mama! Kuda screamed. Tendai turned desperately, trying to find an opening, but the creatures were all around. They moved toward him with a shambling gait. They had eyes. They were people. Tendai watched them slowly turn from nameless horrors to human beings like himself. It's all right, Kuda, he whispered. They're like us. They're Tokolashas? Demons, sobbed Kuda. No, it's all right, murmured Tendai, lowering his brother to the ground. Look at them. They're just very muddy. Kuda clung to his brother, but he seemed less panic-stricken. Tendai took out his knife and pointed it toward the nearest person, an old man with a floppy hat the same color and texture as the ground. Don't touch us, he said quietly. We'll go back with you. Just don't touch us. What do you think's going to happen at this juncture? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. When the holophone rang at the ear, the eye, and the arm detective agency, all three men sprang to answer it. Arm one as he always did. His long, black, snaky arm far outreached anyone else's. Besides, the tips of his fingers were slightly sticky. Hello, detective agency. You lose him, we find him. Sneaky husband's our specialty, he cried. Ear folded his sensitive ears and a look of pain crossed his face. Sorry, 
said Arm, lowering his voice. I, I need your help, said Mother on the hollow screen. You came to the right place, Arm said. Nobody else can do what we do. We can hear a bat burp in the basement. We can see a gnat's navel on a foggy night. Hunches stick to us like gum on your shoe. Got a sneaky husband? Of course not, Mother said with surprise. I'm married to General Amadeus Masika. Ouch, murmured here with his ears folded in like morning glories. I blinked a longer process with him than with most people. I can't explain on the phone, said Mother. If you're not busy, could I send a stretch limo to pick you up? Please don't be busy, she added with a tremor, arm picked up at once. At your service, we'll rearrange our appointments, the detective said graciously. Oh, thank you, Mother cried. She hung up. The men smiled at one another. The area in front of the holophone showed a desk neatly piled with papers, a swivel chair, and what appeared to be a diploma on the wall. Close up, the diploma turned out to be a gift certificate from Mr. Thirsty's beer hall. Just out of hollow screen range were a sink full of dirty dishes, a muddle of food containers, and a sagging couch. Hanging on the wall were the only things of value in the whole office. Three Nirvana guns obtained at great expense when the detectives opened their office. They had been fired only once at the police training range. Do you want me to rearrange the appointments? said I. Arm nodded, so I took down the calendar and erased Take Clothes to Laundry and wrote in Important Case for General Masika instead. She didn't ask how much we charged, that's always a good sign, remarked Gear. But what can Masika want that he can't get? Arm said. He can call in the police, the army, and the Secret Service. If he says boo, a mugger at the other end of the city drops a wallet. I fitted on dark glasses in preparation for going outside. Perhaps it's a question of being too powerful. What do you mean? Ear settled muffs over his ears to protect them from the noisy streets. What happens if an ant bites a lion on the toe? said I. The lion roars, but the ant scurries into a hole. The lion can't find it. He's too big. So you're saying there's a whole world running around under General Masika's feet that he can't reach, said Gear as he looked into the cracked mirror over the dirty dishes. His muffs were getting bald in spots. We know that's true, said I soberly. You have only to look at the cow's guts. Come on, we don't want to miss the limo, Arm said. The three men strapped on the Nirvana guns and triple-checked the locks on the office. Arm braced himself for the assault of sensations from the street. He was the only one who couldn't protect himself, although the thick adobe walls of the office made life somewhat bearable. The others walked on either side as if to shelter him, but there was nothing they could really do. Arm almost cried out as the door opened and the tangle of emotions rushed in. Here, his ears safely nestled in the ragged muffs, could listen to the outside world without pain. I was able to look around confidently. 95% of his eyesight was blocked out. Arm had to suffer the hate, greed, and anger boiling around the suburb known as the cow's guts. Only an occasional whiff of kindness, like a pale flower wilting in an alley, softened his pain. Ear and eye half carried him. Gradually, Arm adjusted as one adjusts to the sound of a jackhammer, but he was never really comfortable stood on the limo landing pad and looked out at the cow's guts. The streets rioted in all directions, twisting around in a confusing way. Newcomers always got lost to the light of the muggers. Stolen goods were sold openly here. Drugs were bought as easily as bananas. Beer halls blasted music that made everyone's ribs rattle, but here and there, among the pickpockets and dealers, a family struggled to survive. These were people from the villages who couldn't afford anything better. Children sailed boats down the fetid gutters and flew kites between the beer hall signs. Here, too, came the beggars after their day's work in the wealthy suburbs. Legless men pushed themselves on little carts. Women with milky eyes led children whose hands stuck out like wings from their shoulders. After dark, these people settled in alleys where they built cook fires and where they sang and danced. Ear, eye, and arm often looked down on these fires and imagined they were back in the distant villages of their childhood. 
Suddenly, the streets of the cow's guts began to empty all around the pad. People disappeared into doorways with magical speed. I laughed as he pointed to General Masika's limo settling down toward the anti-grav units. The government symbol, a black Zimbabwe bird on a green and red background, was clearly marked on the side. They think it's a raid. What a wonderful quiet, Pierce said. Are you the detectives? Yes, you'd have to be, said the chauffeur after the door sprang open. Do you have a permit for those guns? Arm produced the license, but he still had to hand the weapons to the chauffeur for safekeeping. No weapons allowed at the Masikas, the chauffeur explained. Say, would you mind sitting in the back? No offense, but you guys give me the creeps. Here, I and Arm didn't take offense, or not much. They were used to startling people, except in the cow's guts. In the cow's guts, a person could have green wings and purple horns. No one would be the least surprised. Mother had seen the detectives on the hollow screen, but she couldn't help jumping when they appeared close up. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, she stammered. I haven't seen anyone like you before. There isn't anyone like us, said Arm. He extended his hand, and Mother, with only a tiny pause, shook it. She felt the strangest sensation as she grasped the fingers, and not only because they were slightly sticky. It was like touching an electric dynamo. Somewhere inside, energy hummed and might leap out at her. She was relieved to let Arm go. I removed his dark glasses and ear took off his muffs. The three men stood in front of Mother and let her take a long look. Ear, who was white, unfolded his ears. They opened out like huge flowers, pink and almost transparent. I, who was brown, blinked his huge eyes, which were all pupil inside and no white. Arm, who could just as well have been called Leg, stretched out his long black limbs. He reminded Mother of a wall spider. How... How did you happen? She asked. Arm replied. We all come from the village of Wang, near the nuclear power plant. Oh, said Mother. Uh, that's where the plutonium got into the drinking water. Our mothers drank it. Mother stared at them. She knew about the accident, of course, in a distant sort of way. A few people died, others got sick, but it had happened long ago. What must it have been like to have such babies? Hers had been so beautiful. Our parents were delighted when they found out what we could do, said I, blinking in a slow, unnerving way. I could see a flea clinging to a hawk's feathers. My mother never lost anything. So who do the ear, the eye, and the arm remind you of, like perhaps superheroes? Be specific and share with your fellow listeners. And now, seconds more of the ear, the eye, and the arm. I could hear an ant creeping up on the sugar bowl, boasted ear. And what could you do, said mother, bewildered by these strange creatures. I got hunches, Arm said. I used to know when the baboons were planning to raid the field. So, you see, we were ideally suited to become detectives. Who are these people? Growled Father from the doorway. Here closed his ears at once. Arm staggered back as though struck. Detectives, Mother replied. They're going to look for the children. And we'll find out what happens as they do look for the children, and so much more, as the ear... The eye and the arm continues.